uh, any friends and visitors that might have joined us um, this morning, as well as our, our young folk. It's uh, wonderful to join you this morning at this meeting. Um, I'm a little sorry that uh, I just missed being able to be with you in person, uh, having returned to the UK last week. But I suppose technology at least allows me to uh, miraculously look straight at you while staring at my notes at the same time. So while perhaps a little more impersonal, there is some small upside to being able to do it this way. Way back in 1292, uh, Emily Dickinson wrote a, a, the following very short poem. In fact, only one line. And it says, in this short life that only lasts an hour, how much, how little is within our power? And it's a statement that says so much with so few words. It's a statement that is entirely true. We live on a grain of sand floating in an infinite sky. We individually are but a fleck of dust on that grain of sand. And we live for a nanosecond in an infinite timeline. It's a statement that also begs the question, what is the meaning of life? In testing out such a, a deep philosophical and for us at least a spiritual question in a short Sunday exhortation, may it best if you being really polite to me be described as ambitious and more bluntly as stupid. But having recently read, as we always do at this time of the year, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, which to my mind at least deals squarely with the very question of the meaning of life, it seems appropriate to at the very least touch briefly on why we should bother to sit together this morning to remember our Lord and Savior and to give praise and thanks to God of all creation rather than join the eat, drink, and be merry gang down at the beach. Although looking at the clothes some of you are wearing, perhaps uh, it isn't quite beach weather. The other reason for exhorting us on this topic this morning, because as the teacher in Ecclesiastes puts it, when all is said and done, for believers at least, the meaning of life is clear and unambiguous. It's not necessarily easy to pursue as generation after generation have come to discover, but it's nevertheless most clearly and succinctly spelt out in the Bible. You may feel that all of us sitting here today know the meaning of life and that this is a topic better shared with those who don't follow the truth. But do we really, or perhaps more fairly, do we fully contemplate the meaning of our lives as believers? God willing, I assume we're all here because we have the same fundamental or first principle beliefs. There is one monotheistic God, the creator of the universe, of this earth and of us, a God who has revealed his purpose and plan for this earth and for us. We believe in one Savior, the only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom by faith we are able to reconcile our sinful natures with God, who through his grace alone welcomes us into relationship with him and leaves us with the hope of enjoying life eternal with the return of our Lord. That is something or something similar to it, you may say, is the meaning of every believer's life. But I'll suggest to you this morning that that view would be wrong. Not because I say so, but because the truth does. Rather, the creed which I've summarized would hopefully express our purpose in life, the purpose of every believer. And it is perhaps the subtle or not so subtle distinction between the meaning of life and the purpose of life that we'll focus on this morning. And why? The Bible teaches us to live in the light, but does it tell us why we have life in the flesh? God elected to create us. Again, why? As the psalmist in Psalm 89 put it, for what futility you have created all humanity. For the life of mortals is like the grass, according to Psalm 103. Now, there was a chap called Count Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy or Leo Tolstoy, as he's more commonly known, about whom we will talk a little bit more later. He was a famous Russian writer in the 19th century. Many regard him as one of the greatest authors of all time. He wrote such classics as the War, as War and Peace. He also wrote a much shorter book called My Confession, when he encountered his own Ecclesiastes moment in his life, as he faced at crossroads many, but not all, come to in trying to put meaning to our lives. In grappling with this, Tolstoy made a simple 
but for me at least, a very profound statement. He said that faith gives meaning to life after death. Think about that. Faith gives meaning to life after death. There is so much packed into this statement. Firstly, it suggests that without faith, life is meaningless. Think about that. Secondly, Tolstoy is saying that the faith we hold in God and by which we live will only gain any meaning after death. At first blush, that seems to somewhat contradict with what Ecclesiastes tells us in chapter 9 and verse 5, that the dead know nothing, which is of course true. And if death is indeed the permanent end of each of us, then of course life is meaningless. No matter how rich or poor, no matter how famous or unknown, in fact, no matter how many good deeds you have done, in the end it will all be meaningless. If the best you can claim is that you left a legacy, that too is meaningless. Newton and Einstein, for example, may have left us scientific theories that have helped us unlock a tiny window of God's engineering. But as individuals, they are forgotten. They're just names. Tolstoy's point is that if our faith is true, if our faith is based on fact and not fiction, then death is not the end of us, but just the beginning. And therefore, in death, our life, or our faith in life at least, gives meaning to our lives. Brother David Fraser, in one of his Sunday Bible talks a few months ago, made an important point about faith, which I hope I correctly repeat, and my apologies in advance to him if I don't. In referencing the words of Paul in Hebrews 11, in verse 1, that faith is the substance hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Brother David made the point that our faith is not a shot in the dark, but rather that faith and hope are experiential. They're based on things that did occur. For example, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. It happened. So when we place our faith in God and Jesus, we are trusting in something real rather than suppositional or fictional. It's an interesting thought that before the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the meaning of life was very clear. It set out for us in the first three chapters of Genesis, with the key statement contained in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And you don't need to look these up, but it says, and you know these words very well, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then in verse 28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over everything that, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In essence, then, the role of Adam and Eve was to rule over God's creation on earth, in perpetuity. You may say that that's precisely what we do on earth today. Words such as have dominium over and subdue may lend support to that view, but that would not be correct. We need to remember that the earth at the time of Adam and Eve was a very different place to the world in which we find ourselves now. And there are a few key statements in the first three chapters of Genesis that emphasize just how different the earth was. For example, Adam and, Eve's, Adam and Eve were vegetarians, as Genesis 1, 29 makes clear. It repeats the statement in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. But it was not just them. So too were all living creatures, according to Genesis 1 and verse 30. It sometimes feels to me like this is somewhat arbitrary detail to have added to the story. That is, at least until we realize and appreciate its relevance. And the other important differential from the world today is that Genesis in chapter 2 and verse 25 tells us that Adam and Eve were both naked, but felt no shame. Both of these facts describe a world vastly different from the one that has been inhabited since the fall. Yes, there are of course some vegetarians today, but they are few in comparison, and certainly none amongst the lion population that I'm aware of. And yes, some people have no shame in being naked today, but generally that is for ulterior motives. These subtle statements in the first two chapters of the Bible are so very important. They make it clear that the word was that the world was innocent and at peace with God and itself. 
that there was a symbiosis between God and his creation, and between man and his dominion. With all living creatures only looking for the next part to eat, fear amongst them wouldn't have existed. Lust and greed and enmity did not exist. It is with this in mind that we must understand God's direction to man and woman to subdue and have dominion over God's creation. Looking at the definition of these terms in Strong's Concordance, such as subjugate, conquer, force, and keep, when viewed through the lens of fallen man, sound ominous. Certainly subjugation and subduing since the fall has seen man and woman kill, maim and destroy and terrify, wipe out so much of God's creation. No, we have to look at these terms in the context of the innocent and peaceful environment that prevailed before the fall. And I would suggest for your consideration that the Garden of Eden reflected God's power and glory in heaven and replicated it for man and woman's benefit on earth. It was God, then there was the Elohim, then man, then woman, then the creatures, and the submission of each seamlessly beneath their master. Each knew who its master was, and each was at peace with its place in the hierarchy, because none was threatened by the one above, provided they followed, followed God's prescripts. It created order, stability, and continuity. At the same time, it brought glory, glory to God, who held it all together perfectly. This then was the meaning of life, laid out perfectly and perfect in all respects. But of course, at the fall, that all changed. Instead of harmony and symbiosis that prevailed, the new world order was characterized by the three C's, chaos, confusion, and consciousness. And it has been like that ever since. The more we try to civilize ourselves and society, the more chaotic and confusing life becomes. We live by but a veneer of civility and order, nothing more. And that veneer collapses at the slightest hint of disruption. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10 contains that important shift. Man and woman realized that they were naked and hid. Theirs was a realization of vulnerability. We became conscious beings. Before the fall, there was a paradise of life. There was no death. The meaning of life before the fall was to live with God in his paradise. But Adam and Eve had no consciousness of life. You can only be aware of life if you're aware of death. And while God warned them of the penalty of death for disobedience, they had never seen or experienced death and had no concept of it. But today, it is this consciousness that we have both been blessed with and cursed with. I've often thought that it much must be much easier if we could, like the animals, not be conscious from a young age that we were destined to die. Imagine spending your life eating the grass and keeping a weary eye out for any predators and reacting instinctively if they were around, but being entirely unconscious about, unconscious about the fact that you will grow old and die. Well, not so old if that lion moves faster than you do in the days of your youth. Unlike the animals, we now know that our lives are finite. And we know our destiny. We are conscious of good, of evil. We are conscious of our lusts and our greed. And we are conscious that we choose wrong over right all too often. Ever since the three C's of chaos, confusion, and consciousness entered the world, we have seemingly lived from generation to generation in a chaotic contradiction, discovering and developing ourselves and the world at an exponentially faster and faster pace while at the same time destroying ourselves at an equally exponentially rising pace. This chaos has seen us fall deeper and deeper into confusion about the meaning of life. Some believe there is no God, and our existence is just a freakish accident. Others cling to God or a God in a haphazard and self-serving manner. Tolstoy, in his book I mentioned earlier, My Confession, perhaps conveniently summarizes our situation or our dilemma. His book is a brief autobiographical story of his struggle with a midlife existential crisis. It describes his search for the answers to the ultimate philosophical question. If God does not exist, since death is inevitable, what is the meaning of life? 
Without the answer to this, for him, life had become impossible. Tolstoy goes on to describe four possible attitudes towards this dilemma, which I briefly mentioned simply because it helps us in answering our own question. The first is ignorance. If one is oblivious to the fact that death is approaching, life becomes bearable, really along the lines that I've just mentioned about being a, a buck in, in the bush and simply living your life and then ceasing to exist. The problem for Tolstoy, at least for him personally, and probably for all of us as humans, hopefully for all of us as humans, is that he is, he is not ignorant. Having become conscious of the reality of death, there's no going back. The second possibility is what Tolstoy describes as Epicureanism, being fully aware that life is ephemeral. One can enjoy the time one has. Tolstoy's problem with this was essentially a moral one. He states that Epicureanism may work fine and well for the minority who can afford to live the good life, but one would have to be morally empty to be able to ignore the fact the vast majority of people do not have access to the wealth necessary to live this kind of life. Tolstoy then uh, considered the fact that um, the most intellectually honest response to the situation we find ourselves in would be suicide. In the face of the inevitability of death and assuming that God does not exist, why wait? Why pretend that this veil of tears means anything when one can just cut to the chase? For himself, however, and probably for most of us, also he writes that he was too cowardly to follow through on this most logically consistent response. Finally, Tolstoy says that the fourth option, and the one he found himself following, up to that point at least, is the one of just holding on, living despite the absurdity of it all, because he is not willing or able to do anything else. So it seems that life is utterly hopeless at least without God. It was then that Tolstoy turned to the question of God's existence. And he concludes that as soon as he said, God is life, life was once again suffused with meaning. However, while Tolstoy's views may help describe the problem, and may even in some respects help identify the answer, it is of course to the Bible that we turn for the clear answer. Why? Well, precisely because left to man and woman, we have managed to weave a web of confusion about God, if you believe in God, that is, and the meaning of life. There is a seemingly endless proliferation of humanistic-centered views on God that have added to, clarified, or ignored the Bible. The Jews are perhaps the classic example of weaving their own set of rules onto the principles God gave them, but they are not alone. The Quran adds another dimension, and even within Christian denominations, we have seen extensions to the Bible to apparently guide us in our relationship with God. The Catholics, the Jehovah Witnesses being bad examples. But for clarity, we rather choose to place our trust in the inspired word of God only. And this brings us to the reading which Brother Tony kindly read for us this morning from Deuteronomy 4. It both captures the problem and highlights the solution. In the NRV, uh, the chapter is headed Obedience Commanded, which sets the tone. And it starts in verse 1 by calling on the Israelites to listen to the laws that they were about to be taught. So, as it says, ye may live. In a fundamental, and very good reason to listen to them. So their very lives depended on listening to and obeying God's laws. In verse 2, they were directed, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Again, fundamental principle given to the Israelites, which neither they, nor unfortunately many Christian denominations have managed to stick to. We know, of course, from history that the Israelites didn't, and added liberally to and clarified whatever they were taught. And this petition and warning from God becomes clear in particular. Uh, from what follows in verses 32 to 40. And I'm going to use, so in order to use the NIV translation, because for me it brings out some of the key focal points of our exhortation this morning. I won't go through all of them, but just to highlight a couple of them. In verse 32, it says, Ask now about the former days, long before your time, from the day God created human beings on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other, 
has anything so great as this ever happened, or anything like it ever been heard of? Verse 33, has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire, as you have, and lived? Verse 35, you were shown these things that you might know that the Lord is God. Beside him, there is no other. Verse 36, from heaven he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words from out of the fire. And in verse 39, it says, Acknowledge and take heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Keep his decrees and commands which I'm giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children uh, you, you, and that you may live long in the land your Lord God gives you for all time. So notice in particular that verses 32 and 35 and 39 that God emphasizes his uniqueness. There is no other. So what is the meaning of life? Verse 10 of chapter 4 says, I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they shall live upon the earth. And if we think about it, it pulls the entire chapter together. It pulls both the warning God gives in the beginning, and it pulls together the principle of him being God alone, and to him that we should only look. And if this principle of life and the meaning of life isn't clear enough from Deuteronomy 4, then the Bible makes it repeatedly clear. In fact, according to Strong's Concordance, the phrase, fear God, or fear the Lord, appears 134 times. It's a fair amount of emphasis. It's also the conclusion the teacher in Ecclesiastes comes to at the end of describing life as otherwise meaningless. In chapter 12 and verse 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Interestingly, the teacher draws this conclusion earlier in the book of Ecclesiastes. Again, using the NIV translation in chapter 3 and verse 14, he says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. And again, in chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, and from verses 15 to 18, he says, in this meaningless life of mine, I've seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And this thread of fearing God we know runs throughout the Bible. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 starts off by saying, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Proverbs 19 and verse 23 again says, Fear the Lord, fear of the Lord leads to life. And the fear of God is not something limited to the Old Testament. Just a couple of examples from the New Testament include Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's in Chapter 2 and verse 12, where he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And again, his instruction in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1 uh, says, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of flesh and spirit, affecting holiness in the fear of God. And even Jesus urged us in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, to take heed of that, where he says, and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now the term to fear God is of course not something new to us, and many a brother has spoken or, or written about the reverential fear whereby we hold our all-powerful God in awe and respect. And that the term does of course in both translation and in context often hold that reverential meaning, and certainly becomes a central pillar to our relationship with God once we have submitted to him. But Strong's Concordance tells us it also means simply to fear or to terrify, to terrify or to be afraid of. And it is this context that gives meaning to our lives. Why? Why does God insist over and over and over again at the beginning of our wisdom, the very meaning of our lives, 
is to be terrified of him. It seems on the face of it to contradict the greatest command which Christ taught us, to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and all our minds and all our strength. And we know from our own experiences in meeting our partners who we want to spend the rest of our life with, that we generally don't associate fearing with them as the first experience before we love them. Perhaps at best we may love them so much that we may fear losing them, but that's not the same as the fear of the terror of God. Why therefore is the terror of God the point of departure? Well, I'd suggest to you that it's precisely for all the reasons we've discussed this morning. Unless you truly believe that there is a creator of all the universe, and one so powerful that truly choose to could, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, wipe us off the face of the earth, here and now, in the blink of an eye. We cannot truly believe in God's existence. We tremble at a God so powerful that he could establish an earth so intricate in an infinity so large that no matter how many generations of humans walk the earth, we will never come close to understanding, let alone replicating even a fraction of it. You see, brothers and sisters, unless we first and foremost believe in a God that is awesome and powerful, we cannot truly believe in God at all. And if we do not truly believe in God, then we cannot love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. True fear brings true affirmation of a God we cannot see. Unlike the love of our lives, who we can see and touch and therefore love, we need to feel in our hearts and grasp fully in our minds the awesome power of God before we can truly submit, submit to and to love him. If we don't fear God, then it leads to precisely what, have, what we have seen generation after generation, with humans have either discounted God altogether and laid claims to theories such as evolution, or have added to God's truth to satisfy themselves of an explanation of a God they are more comfortable with. And if there's any doubt as we draw this discussion to a close this morning, and we bring ourselves to remember our Lord. Our Savior in Christ affirmed that the fear of God is indeed the meaning of life. Christ gave us many examples of this, but perhaps two and the two most obvious ones emphasize it. Firstly, as our Lord was tempted in the, that most torturous of conditions in the desert for 40 days after his baptism, he put food and power aside because he feared God more than life. And through such fear, he believed and trusted that God would be with him. And the other example, of course, was his prayer of anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he set aside his will and submitted himself to God. Who else can lay claim with such boldness as Jesus did in John chapter 10 and verse 13? But just as the Father knows me, I, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So to conclude, brothers and sisters, on the meaning of life, and the fact that it starts with the fear of God, I, I thought it would be useful to quote briefly from Brother L.A. Sargent's expose on the book of Ecclesiastes, which was first published in the Christadelphian in 1955. I quote just two paragraphs from it, but it really summarizes um, the, the topic that we discussed this morning. Brother Sargent says, fear God is a characteristic imperative found in the book in context in contexts which give it weight and authority. It can fittingly stand as a conclusion to be drawn from the whole. Keep his commandments follows as a natural sequel. This is the universal truth, and no man is exempt from this principle. To obey is every man's obligation and within every man's power. This would accord with Paul's uh, contention in Romans 1, that men are without excuse, because the invisible things of God from the creation of the world, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Men who will not recognize this refuse to have God in their knowledge, and so are given over to a reprobate mind. But the sergeant goes on to say, the fear of God claims a man in his entirety, and it is in this that the son of Adam becomes whole. Koheleth, or the preacher, in finding the futility of all things around him, had discovered his own incompleteness. Only as a man becomes related to God by the awe which brings obedience, does he reach fullness in himself in his own life. And when the saying is thus understood, the conclusion does truly add to the coping stone, to the 
thus truly add the coping stone to Ecclesiastes. Only one perfectly attained the communion with God, and of him it was said, Behold the man, and of his brethren it is written, Ye are complete, full, full in him.